This is the fourth lecture about computer-aided archaeology and in this lecture I would like to introduce to you some basics of data visualization um, and motivate that in this lecture and give you some theoretical background while the actual procedures will be covered in the um, lab videos where you will see how you can do some of these visualizations directly in LibreOffice Calc with your database which you have by now uh, established in LibreOffice Space. But here we are talking about more about the theoretical part and what is possible and also I will cover some things that are not directly uh, possible in LibreOffice Calc. Well, all the diagram types you will see are in one way or the other possible to achieve in LibreOffice Calc, but some of them require more um, interaction, more um, yeah, hand-tailored versions, um, solutions than others. So we will concentrate in the lab videos on those things that are actually um, readily available in Calc, while in this video here I will show you a bit beyond the rim of the plate and give you some other informations about what kind of other visualizations are there possible. To start things off, um, why should we actually visualize data? Um, the art of visualizing data is to convert the raw data into form that is viewable and understandable to humans, to reduce the complexity and highlight certain aspects of the data that uh, for us seem to be necessary to transmit to the audience. And that also means that we can strongly influence the way of how people will understand our data visualization. So a bit of ethical part also comes here um, into play. In general, we are humans, we are um, evolved to interpret visual patterns. That's how we survived. Um, that's how we distinguished the, the striped fur of a the tiger from the striped fur of a um, zebra, for example, if they ever met somewhere. But um, we, from our biological um, base, we are very well suited to identify patterns from their visual appearance. So when we transform data, pure data numbers, into something that's visual and that's more condensed, we are able to transmit much more information on one go and enable the reader to better understand the pattern that we see in the data that are in the data or that we actually want to uh, the reader to believe that are in the data and also we are able with certain kinds of data visualization to transcendent the two dimensions that we are limited to by the materiality of the our usual publication formats that is for example printed books but also um, screens. Uh, all these are two-dimensional objects and to show more dimensions of the data in one go we need to s use some clever tools from the data visualization techniques to enable yeah, a more complete representation of the data. We will start off with a very simple way of visualizing data that does not involve so much graphics but first let's start about what is actual data and from what you already practically applied for the construction of your database you know the basic principle here that is some kind of paradigm that is used all over computational archaeology so most of the time we have some items for which we want to like to collect some uh, values and in your database tables you also already have seen that these items by convention are horizontally aligned, so each row represents one item of our interpretation. While in the vertical space, most of the time distinct here are several columns, and these are usually called variables in database. Um, these are fields of our database, but when it comes to this kind of um, um, spreadsheet view, for example, uh, the different columns represents the variables here 
these are different information that we like to record for each individual item and they can come in different um, information densities so to say or information qualities here for example we have some data on age and this data here is given as an integer number so a full number without any uh, values in between if you tell someone your age you usually say I'm 22 and not I'm 22 uh, three months uh, and one week and another day usually we just give here an um, integer value as our age while for our height for example we can give some more um, specific information some more detailed information so we already can see here while we are in both situations talk about numbers there is a difference in uh, the way how we re represent these numbers and here for example we have also a column for sex or gender and this comes with a certain set of, of values that these individual um, items can have in this variable um, so here we have another quality of data and even though you could imagine that this gender category is more open than just male and female still there is a limited um, number of values that can go in here if we do not measure gender with a more um, detailed approach but usually it's done like that so essentially we have different data qualities and I will go to these uh, in a second but for this here it is important that we have always some items most of the time they are displayed as rows with some variables which are displayed in the individual columns and the individual cells here have a specific value and that is the value that we are talking about for this item in this variable so already said we have some levels of different levels of measurements in which we can define values that uh, specific variables can take and the most basic one is the nominal or categorical uh, category where we have things that can be named there is a bird it has a color and uh, it is also awesome uh, and we can distinguish this item here from another item um, purely by that is another item but also it can has other values here and we can name these values here so species for example um, but these species do not have as such a defined relationship you cannot say for example a seahorse is two times a bird so there is um, no way of doing some um, elaborated mathematics on the values themselves we can just count them uh, for example and see how many seahorses we have in our aquarium and how many birds hopefully zero birds in the aquarium so these are the nominal values nominal uh, level of measurement you can name stuff and you can count the number of stuff that you have with the specific name that follows the specific category a bit more information rich is the ordinal category where we have um, things that are named but these individual um, values have a certain relationship to each other so there's a rank that we can determine given that a specific value is taken so we can order them in a specific way and this is has of course more information than if you just can name things here for the interpretation that is very interesting and helpful and you will wonder how much things are actually ordinal scaled that we um, do not have them but here we can always scale down and say we treat these ordinal scaled variables as if they were just nominal scaled and we lose a bit of information here but this depends always on the question um, that we have so the ordinal scale variables are those which we can order according to some kind of gradient but we do not distinguish how much difference is here between hot and hotter or hottest we don't know if hottest is double as hot as hotter according to hot so there is no defined distance here between 
the different uh, values that we have. We can order them, but we cannot do any further mathematical operations with them. The next one, or the two next ones, are often combined into one category, and that's the metric category. So we measure actually values. And these measured values come in two distinct um, um, flavors. We can easily identify this uh, difference in this um, temperature scale here. When we have zero degree Kelvin, that is the absolute zero point, and there is no way to get colder, at least from what we know currently from physics. So that's a defined zero, and we can always say that 200 degrees Kelvin is, for example, double as hot as 100 degree Kelvin. While in the Celsius scale, we have an arbitrary zero point. By accident or by convention, that's the point where ice melts. But it's arbitrary chosen in respect of the absolute zero. So uh, here, the different the, um, distances between certain values is defined in something that we can measure. But the ratio between the values um, do not have the same meaning. For example, you cannot say that 100 degree uh, is double as hot as 50 degree Celsius because um, this is not correct in terms of their ratio. So in the end we are measuring uh, movement of atoms with the temperature and here the atoms do not move double as fast with 100 degree compared to 50 degree because we have this arbitrary zero point here. So these kind of values where we have an arbitrary zero point are called interval scaled, while if there is an absolute zero point we have a ratio scaled variable here. For us, most of the time here, that probably doesn't make so much of a difference, but for certain statistical um, applications it makes a huge difference. So we can treat these measured values most of the time together as metric values, but when it comes to more specific um, application, uh, there need to be the distinction between interval scaled and ratio scaled. To put that all into one frame, we have the nominal scaled variables where we can count how many items belong to one category or the other, but there is no here no x-axis that gives us any information about the relationship between these two variables. We could just switch A to B and this would not change the picture here. While if we have ordinal scaled variables, we cannot switch the individual um, items because they have an order um, by their value, by their definition. But still, so we can sort stuff here, but um, still we can only count the number of cases per type and go on with that. And then with interval and uh, ratio scaled, here uh, with interval scaled we can measure the, dif uh, the differences between the different um, instances. And with uh, ratio scaled we can also calculate if something is double as intense as something else here. In practice most of the time we will have here some names and here some measured values. Here we have something that's expressed most of the time in letters while here we have most of the time something that expressed in numbers. And these numbers can also take different flavors. On the one hand we have discrete variables, and this is also true for categorical values, um, if there are a fixed number of uh, values that an individual item can take for a specific variable. Um, so here in this example we can count how many cones of ice we have and we can define um, how many cubes or balls of ice uh, in the individual cones are. But um, so there is a discrete values um, that have no in-between value. So usually you will not have half of a ball of ice in your cone. Uh, scoops is actually the right word. While we have on the other hand continuous var values where variables where the values can also take all values and all intermediate values. For example if we weight the amount of ice uh, in cone 3 we get a specific number and if the temperature is rising and some of the ice is leaking off, then we will get another 
uh, measurement here that's slightly a bit lower than this one. So the weight here in theory can take up any values and the closer we are measuring, the more precise uh, scale for example we have, the more precise values we will get, the more numbers behind zero we will get here. So whenever we have something where uh, the values can take some broken values here for example, then we have a continuous variable, continuous data and these are most of the time these measured data so they can only occur in situations where we have metric valu values, measured values in relation to interval or ratio scale. Well discrete data can take can happen all the time and for the measurement it's also possible to have discrete values but most of the time in reality they are not discrete they are continuous data. So this is a bit of background that uh, might be helpful to understand why there are certain classes of variables which we have already seen when constructing the database. You had the choice for example to have a field in um, uh, integer or in float and while integer is um, the, the rounded number that takes specific uh, um, although um, yeah infinite values but we don't have any values in between when we have a float variable we say that we can have also all the values in between and the precision is only dependent on the precision of our recording device um, so the measurement device or the device with which we store the data. Okay, now let's come really to some visualization techniques and the easy, most easy one, most straightforward one doesn't include any graphical display. That's the cross table or contingency table uh, or sometimes in the spreadsheet software it's called pivot table. And that's a summar summary of data according to specific variables that are most of the time um, categorical variables. So we count the number of occurrence in respect to some categorical values. And these categorical values can also be counted or measured values. So in this case here we have some, for example, different ceramic objects. We have different layers in our excavation and the number of knobs on the ceramic object uh, gives us another um, variable here that can be, this is uh, also a count variable, but we can treat that as a nominal variable. So we can always downscale here. And if we now count how many objects we have from a certain layer with a certain number of knobs, I can't remember the actual word for that, um, then we get to this kind of representation. So now, instead of having the individuals here in the rows, we have the layers here and we can count how many of these items that we had before have one knob and how many have three knobs. So in that case, it's these two here that represents the data in our table. And then we go on per layer and per um, number of knobs here and fill up this whole table. Of course there is a function in the spreadsheet software also in LibreOffice Calc that is doing that for you and that's called pivot table. You will see in the practical video how you can achieve that. It's a bit hidden because it's part of how you can uh, visualize categorical values using a bar chart for example. Nevertheless um, that already condenses the data um, quite significantly and makes it easier to understand patterns in the data. One thing of data condensation is that we have probably here more uh, variables that we have also recorded for the different objects, but for this contingency table we leave them out and just concentrate on the interplay between two of these variables here and also we lose the information about the identity of the, in the different objects here. Um, that's one thing and the other thing is we reduce also the number of rows that we have according only to the number of different instances of the variables that we can have. So with that we also get a much co more condensed uh, visualization of our data and if there is a pattern it becomes 
much more easily visible than if we would just look over all the individual items here. So this counts also as some kind of data visualization techniques, although it doesn't involve any graphical display and can be already very helpful to understand your data better. But I assume you're here more to see elaborated graphical um, presentation of your data. So let's switch to this kind of representation and we can um, see that these have quite some history already. For example, I have here some, some early versions. This is William Playfair uh, 7086 and here you can see the an investigation of the imports and exports between Denmark and Norway. And what we can see here from this chart is when we have some overlap of the imports against the exports. So this is already an early uh, example of how you can have a good data visualization with which you can immediately transfer your information or your political agenda by choosing a nice and easy to understand representation of your data. Here's another example from uh, Florence Nightingale, who was uh, a nurse at the Krim um, war. Um, and this is 1857. And she wants to give a report on the different uh, mortality. So, so she uh, was later very, very uh, influential uh, in respect to um, the development, for example, also of uh, the general health service and uh, modern uh, medical systems. So here she chose to display different causes of mortality and also this is easy to read in a way that we have quite a complex representation here. We have um, different times of the year, we have different causes here and also there is a comparison between um, different years. So with that we can easily see, for example, how there's a huge increase and a decrease in mortality over time. So again, quite simple measures, but quite an um, impressive result with which you can transfer the information that you would like to give other people with ease. And here's one of the most famous examples from Joseph Minar, and it displays the um, the campaign of Napoleon against uh, Russia. And you can see the size here represents how big the army was at the time. And you can see here the move towards Moscow and then the retreat and how little, how few people uh, came back from the original army. So you have uh, representation of um, a value, the size of the army, at the same time geography and time and uh, with that it's a very easy to understand representation about the history of this campaign and how it failed. So these are early examples and you can see already with some simple um, tools and some um, creative ways of using that you can transfer quite an amount of complex data with just one picture. And that's where graphical representation shines. We have multiple dimensions here in the data and they can all be viewed within just looking at one chart. So what are usually the objects of visualization? Most of the time we have our items that can represent be represented in different forms. Either we have some individual points for the items or we have lines if there is some kind of continuity going on we have there already uh, one dimension more most of the time you will have lines when there is something that is connected to each other or you can have areas when you want to display the amount of things but we'll come to that a bit later so we have representation in 0d 1d or 2d and we can always also represent relationships of these objects, for example, if they are contained in a common type or if they are connected in one way or the other, so individual data points, for example, in at a time and then that there is a connection between them, that there is some kind of identity between them. You can think of both things as 
representations of the same things that we have seen in the database um, world. Um, so the individual items here represents the entities in our database um, view perspective, while the links uh, represent some relationships of uh, the items among each other. And these are yeah, the basic um, objects with which we uh, operate in visual display. But we want to display several informations and for this uh, we need to have more than most of them more than two dimensions. Since spatially we have only two dimensions in all our publication um, methods and mediums, there are other ways to represent um, their, um, the different informations using different other channels that we can use to transfer additional information. For example, position. We have seen examples with uh, position uh, at the MINAR uh, map, for example. Um, we can have coordinates. We can also have some kind of tilt or slope or orientation. Uh, but we can also use color and not only distinct colors, but also the saturation of colors or transparency to represent more subtle differences. We can use textures, that's not so very well uh, represented here, but here, for example, you can see some textures when it comes to zones, so to two-dimensional objects. Um, we can use shape to distinguish identity between different um, objects. Of course, size or volume to represent um, yeah, amount of things, um, so length, area, or actually 3D volume, but this is since we have a two-dimensional representation, it doesn't make so much sense in most of the representations and you will see an example why that doesn't make sense later on. And when we have a more complete uh, representation, also the proximity or density of objects in our chart can give us some extra information and adds another dimension to what we can display. We can use and play with all these different uh, objects. You can think of them as different um, dimensions of your data and a way to represent these different dimensions of your data. And here is just a con collection of um, all these things together. So what kind of objects we have, um, one 0D, 1D or 2D objects and what kind of um, yeah differences you can express and how you can express differences here with the different um, dimensions uh, or different uh, items, different features of the items uh, and how you can use that in a creative way to display information. We can also combine, that's the aim here, to different dimensions. For example, we can here have a simple representation of um, a quantitative attribute, a metric attribute, for example, here represented by the height of the line or the count value. Uh, so it's also a quantitative attribute. And we can distinguish different categorical attributes, different items, for example, the count of different artifact types uh, in this way. Um, if we have a second quantitative attribute, we can also add that as a second um, um axis here, so then we have a y-axis that also makes sense in respect of a specific quantitative attribute. So the channel here is still the position of the different points here. We lose the possibility to uh, express the amount here, but we can, for example, add another categorical distinction again back with different colors, and we can add another quantitative attribute here in having different size here, and with that we have again, a 4D representation of our data. So there are different ways of combining these different dimensions or channels of visualization to get a more complete and more complex representation of our data. And we talked about levels of measurements. And of course, you can use different of these channels, different of these um, information dimensions to map different um, levels of measurements. For some, it works to also map ordinal and quantitative or metric variables. For some, it's not so easy. So for example, with the shape, usually you can only represent ordinal 
differences or nominal differences. We can distinguish these individual shapes, but we most of the time do not have a um, measure of the differences of the shapes. So most of the time you will use the shapes only to represent different categories. While with size, we can have a specific um, size um, information and with that an ordinal representation is uh, possible and if we have um, if we distinguish these sizes in a very fine grid we can also map metric values or counted values with that and not having only classes of sizes but actual values of sizes here. The same might be true for orientation either we have used the orientation just as a representation of a symbol or these actually have quantitative meanings. With color uh, it's more obvious we can have different colors representing different identities or we can have something like a color scale here that is uh, differentiated in respect of saturation here or in this uh, respect of transparency and with that we can also represent intensity of a value. Val the value the metric value of a value using the color scale. And you probably will also find other possibilities here from what we have seen before to be able to use these different channels for representing either nominal variables or also metric quantitative variables. Okay, so with that let's go to the general structure of um, data representation and there are some things that are generally um, relevant for no matter what kind of um, yeah chart with what actually chart you would like to use most of the time on the one hand we would like to express our data with the least amount of noise least amount of information that's not necessary um, for the the viewer to, for the reader to understand the information that we would like to um, convey. And that's what uh, Edward Tufti had expressed as the graphical excellence which gives the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. Or to have that more condensed, the data ink ratio, the proportion of graphics ink devoted to non-redundant display of data information. Also no chart junk. We do not like to fill our charts with some nice symbols or 3D objects if they doesn't help to transform, transfer the information that we would like to transfer. So the more simple the visualization is, most of the time the better the visualization is. That's true for nearly all, for all uh, graphical visualizations that we would like to use, at least in scientific context, context. The other thing that's most common is um, that in general we have some elements in the different charts that are also found in s different ways in different chart types. Let's start simple. Most of the time we have at least one axis that represents some kind of identity of our objects we would like to have. If we have just one variable we most of the time have an x-axis. If we have two variables that are mapped against each other, we also will have a y-axis here. And that forms the area of the, um, of the diagram. Um, this can be actual measured values. The y-axis, this can also be uh, um, categories or counts. Uh, and the same is true for the x-axis. And within this space, most of the time we have some kind of symbol for our data that represents the actual individual items of our data set. The rest is um, descriptive and uh, enhancing the understanding. So most of the time we will have some kind of title, also um, representation of the values that we are uh, measuring or displaying in the axis. And this is kind of mandatory that we show what the, the individual axes actually are showing um, to identify which values are where positioned here most of the time we have these tick marks and some tick descriptions here and you can have also a legend that um, explains the viewer what individual um, yeah, shapes for example mean and how they have to be interpreted. Some of these things you will find 
in nearly all or most of the things you will find in nearly all rep data representation uh, in one way or the other. Okay, let's jump in and start with one of the chart types that you will probably are very familiar with is if you have seen at least one or two um, elections or votings in the past and I assume you did you will have seen these pie charts here and they are used to represent proportions uh, of nominal scaled variables so we have here I don't know actually what this represents probably a uh, um, space in the in Europe uh, and area in Europe I don't think this is true but let's imagine that it would be like that so we have um, um, nominal scaled variable and we have proportions of this nominal scaled variable on a whole object and you can also have that in uh, multiple layers multiple hierarchies for example here the others are again represented in another pie chart that where this other 21% now forms the full um, 100%. Um, it is expressed in a way that we have an ar the area representing the amount of data, the area of the um, circle and the, uh, the, the slices of the circle represents the proportion of the actual counted data from the total data. There are some things that make pie charts a bit problematic although the widespread of its use and the seemingly easy way to understand them. One is color selection can influence the perception for example this lilac uh, here or uh, violet is a much stronger color than this soft yellow here for example so this will dominate your perception you will always see this part bigger as this part um, that's one thing and small differences are not so easy visible uh, so for example here Iceland versus Greece from just looking at the chart you would not be able to distinguish these differences in a pie chart what it makes it much worse is if you start to use a pie chart in 3d for example here um, when you flip this into 3d of course perspective comes into the equation and with perspective uh, things get very very complicated because our eyes and our brain try to compensate that and that makes it difficult really to understand that uh, for example here the uh, this part here this part here and this part here they have all the same proportion on the full um, value of whatever it is the total amount of data but this looks much smaller for example than this part here it looks much bigger also as this part so the proportion uh, the, the perspective uh, bias our representation and this part here for example is just a bit smaller but you will not be able to identify this distinction here from looking at a pie chart the reason for that is beside perspective and even if we just stick to a normal two-dimensional view here um, that our eyes our brain is much more trained to identify differences in um, sizes in length um, not so much differences in areas because there we have two lengths together and uh, with that there is much more uncertainty for us um, to identify how the differences are. For example here when it comes to areas this point here and that point here the difference is three times so this time point here has three times the area to that point. This point here has five times the area than that point. These two points here A are always the same but you cannot easily read this information directly from the area. So that's one reason why pie charts are a tricky thing to interpret and should not be used too much because there is a much better alternative and that's the bar chart or bar plot. Here we can easily understand um, the differences and also the ratios of the differences between the different values. So here A is half of B and we can directly see that from looking at the chart here and here A is 
uh, a quarter of b and also that can be easily uh, understand probably you will not directly be able to fully see that's exactly four times but you will get a feeling for these differences much better than if you would compare just the area of the pie chart here so that's why i strongly recommend to stick to bar plots whenever it makes sense only if you have really really good reasons to go to the pie chart although it's one of the most common seen uh, graphical representation of data and bar plots are very uh, versatile you can for example uh, display with them counts for different values different categories here so here we have a categorical um, value categorical variable in the x-axis and here in the y-axis we have a count you can also use uh, metric values here for example in the uh, y-axis to represent um, measured values and also you can stack these different objects here if this makes sense to have another dimension represented which is much more convenient and easier to understand than with the pie chart that we have seen before that also represented two levels of information here but uh, this is much more complex and not so easy to see the differences than if we would have the stacked pie chart here and also we can have a um, side by side bar plot where we have the different categories for example over time or the same categories with respect to another category we also can combine that with for example another graphical representation of for example the total developments here and also we can use that like with a pie chart to represent proportions of a total and also this can be combined with different layers of information so that makes the bar plot although it seems to be a bit more boring than a pie chart um, a much more versatile tool for representing anything that has to do with categorical variables might it be a categorical variable and measured variables with that or a categorical variable and another categorical vari variable and you can combine different layers you could also combine this into a stacked and side by side uh, bar plot but then also it will probably become very very hard to read for your uh, reader so in that case it might be clever to have a more differentiated representation of two different perspectives on the data still this is possible with a bar plot and even though it would be quite complex to read it would still be more uh, understandable than using a pie chart but what you probably have thought of in the first place when it comes to charts are these scatter plots and this is also something that we can see quite often especially in scientific literature and uh, scatter plots are used if we want to represent two both for time metric variables against each other and their relationship so what we can see here are again the elements that we have seen before for charts with an x-axis and y-axis both represents here um, a length of um, and width of burials from one of the from the example data set that I have used uh, for also showing you uh, how a database works and what we can see here is that uh, there is a relationship between length of burials and length here and width here uh, because they more or less are arranged on a line that means the higher the length will be the wider also the burial might be so the more area it will have so with that we have quite an amount of information that we can represent just with this 2d representation and you can also use some quantitative methods which we will not uh, go further here to represent the relationship for example this formula up here means that y is represented by 0 0.3 times x plus a specific value here so this is the relationship that is represented in this blue trend line here you can easily plot a trend line also in LibreOffice base um, to get an information about the relationship between the two variables and you can also calculate an R square value that gives you an information about how strict this relationship is R square would be one if uh, knowing one variable will to totally determine the other variable and you would definitely be able to 
know the value of the other variable if you have just measured one of them. Zero means there's no relationship, so that would be just a point cloud here without any structure. And anything in between means there's a certain kind of relationship. The higher the R-square value is, the higher this relationship will be. But this is already quite advanced um, interpretation of the data, and this goes into the uh, realm of regression analysis. We will not cover that here. It's enough for you to know that with these scatter plots, you can represent um, the relationship between two measured variables and uh, display the individual items here in respect to one or the other variable. And you can think of that as that these variables represent the coordinates of the values, if you would have y and x coordinates from the geographical space, for example, you would have a map. And how this turns out, we will see when we turn to the GIS. But it's the same logic here. We map our values according to the coordinates that are defined by the variable measurements that we have here. So these three options are easily accessible in uh, LibreOffice Calc, and I encourage you to use certain of them to later on represent also your data and this will be part of your homework. But there are other tools and with other tools also other options with which you can represent data. Um, some of you have already had this R course and know all the stuff I'm currently talking about. And with R uh, specific statistical um, software you have much higher variety of representing your data. And the possibilities of LibreOffice Calc just by point and click uh, analysis ends here. In R, you can also do these scatter plots. You can also map much more elaborated trend lines here, although in LibreOffice Calc, there are also other trend lines that can be visualized here. But R and other statistical tools give you more options for graphical display. And we will go shortly over some of these options. And either you will invest some time finding out how you can do that with LibreOffice Calc yourself, or at a certain point, you will probably like to use another um, software. And then you have already heard of some of these graphical representations. So this is more an outlook here. Um, the actual necessary things to know kind of end here, but at the end we will come back to something that you also will need in that course here. So one of the things that you can also use to display data is the box plot, which is a very, very handy tool. Um, you probably have seen that already uh, in some instances. And that's um, quite a simple idea in the end. So if we have the numbers from 1 to 9 here, for example, 5 is the number that's exactly in the middle. If we order these data from the smallest to the biggest, and we have only these numbers here as our measurements, five will be the value that's exactly in the middle. And this is so the so-called median, and this in a box plot represents this black line here, or here this green line. And then we have the box itself, so this grayish area here, and that represents half of the data. So uh, half of the data, it's the data from 3 to 7. It's not directly half because we have the 5 also here, but yeah, kind of half of the data. Um, and this is the inner half if we order them, if we sort them. So this is what is represented by the box here. And it's the, the uh, lower and the upper quantile here. So that's a quarter of the data that's above the most middle value, and that's the quarter of the data that's below the most middle value. And then we have some whiskers here, uh, which represents the last value that's within 1 times 5, the distance of this inner quantile here. So what is not f more far away than 1.5 here is represented by this, um, yeah, by this line here and this dashed uh, connection. And what is beyond that, you will have some individual points here, and that's some outliers. So we have already an interpretation in this box plot. And this box plot gives you a nice way of um, visualizing or also comparing one variable in respect to its distribution, but also 
in respect to other values uh, or other categories. So for example, here we have the representation of the uh, fibula of the burial ground of Münzingen. And uh, we can see here a box plot where we have quite a um, uh, blocked or condensed, quite of normal distributed, you could say, um, length of the uh, fibula according to um, yeah, the total length of the fibula. But we have two outliers here. So we can already see that most of the, our data behave more or less the same, while two of these uh, objects here are a bit different. And if we specify here in respect to the fibula scheme, Latin A, B, and C, A, B, and C, you can see that these outliers here are actually the uh, fibula from Latin C scheme, so they are much longer here, while A and B, although B is not so widespread, the data according to the length, they are comparable to the lengths of the fibula of shame E here. So with that, we have an easy tool to, to identify or interpret the value of one variable and also to compare that to other uh, categories. The next thing is a bit different. That's uh, It's called histogram and that gives you an also the information about the distribution of a variable, but this time as a count in respect to um, individual classes. So if we have all our fibulas and their length here, uh, if we count how many fall between 20 and 40, we get 3 here. How many between 40 and 60, we get 10 here. 60 and 80, we have 2. Then we have uh, don't have any uh, from 80 to 100. And then 1 that's from 100 to 120. And 1 that's from 140 to 120. And here we can also see the distribution that most of our data are in this lower range of fibula length while some outliers are here. The downside of um, a histogram is, like with most other um, representations, we reduce precision because we don't know any longer where the individual fibulas are uh, here, um, which actual values we have here. We have just this bucket in which all the individual fibulas will fall. Uh, and if we change the size of the buckets here, we get a different picture here. So the actual display of the distribution of our values for this one variable depends very much on how wide we choose the buckets here or the classes in which we distinguish our data. So neither, so box plot is not directly possible uh, with just one click in LibreOffice Calc, but there is a way to also calculate a box plot there, because at first we have to calculate the the median and the quantiles and then the outliers and then we can create an artificial box plot. And the same is true for histogram. We have to first classify our values um, and then we count how many of them fall into the classes and then we can make a pseudo histogram from the data that we have collected or um, processed here. Most real statistical programs will do that for you. LibreOffice Calc is not doing that. I think uh, also Microsoft Excel don't have a histogram or a box plot there, but I'm open to learn that there this might be different here. You can do that, these two representations with a bit of extra uh, effort, but you don't have to do that here either because in this course you don't need that, or there are better software out there with which you can achieve this kind of visualization. The last thing here is um, to overcome the problems with this arbitrary chosen um, widths of the different buckets for a histogram. There's also something that called kernel density or kernel smoothing, uh, for which we see the density of dates according to different um, values here of the actual variable. So you can think of that as a smoothed, continuous uh, representation of the histogram. And you can also map both things on top of each other in most statistical software to see how the connection is. And with that, we can see, for example, by the density that most of the values within this 40 to 60 bucket are actually on the lower end here and not so many on the higher end. So 
it's it's a nice way to enhance for example a histogram by plotting these two things together kernel density estimation is not possible as far as i know from uh libreoffice calc or it would require quite a lot of extra work to make this possible so leave that to other statistical software if you later in your career would like to use something more elaborate okay last thing to say um how you style and how you create your uh, charts really can make a difference and influence the statement that you would like to transfer. This is my always go-to example here. That's uh, the financial crash of 2009. And if we uh, display here the, the stock market in a specific way, um, we can see here a huge crash that takes place around 2009 uh, of the stock market and a slight recovery later on so this image here looks very very dramatic but if we include the zero value here um, the stock market crash becomes much less dramatic than if we let the diagram start at the 4000 value the lowest value that you have within the crash so here we can already see that this crash was not so totally devastating and if we inc increase the time that we are looking at here over uh, the history we can see that here at 2003 there was an even more dramatic crash putting this crash here into perspective and if we increase the time again to the total duration of our data series here we can see that uh, until let's say 2000 uh, 1997 or so um, this was actually the highest value that the stock market ever had so this crash just brought it back yeah well nearly 10 years but then the recovery is also very fast so what um, part of your data is represented and how you design your um, charts makes a difference in what kind of message is transferred so you should stay honest with your data and try to enable the reader to understand as much of your data as possible you can also of course turn that around and try to use these chart tools to enhance your uh, message but most of the time you will have some people that will detect that and will bash you for that so try to stay as honest as possible with your graphical representation and also try to minimize the number of the, the amount of ink that you use to show information do not make unnecessary enhancement to the layout. Try to avoid any 3D representation because usually they don't help the reader to understand your data. Most of the time they're actually biasing the reader or uh, obscuring the actual pattern that's in the data. And always use the suitable chart for your data. So you have to consider what kind of data you have. Nominal, ordinal, interval or ratio scale data and choose for the different purposes the right way of displaying the data and to give you a bit of help here that goes also beyond that course here's a small table um, you can use for if you want to have a percentage um, um, or proportion you can always use pie charts but it's better to use stacked bar plots or bar plots in general if there are multiple possible answers here and some draws a uh, horizontal bar chart is much better than a pie chart and also a stacked pie chart. If you want to compare different values from different variables, you can have a grouped bar plot comparison of parts of a whole. You can use the stacked bar plot as I have shown before. It's always a good drop in for a pie chart. If there are some developments involved, you can lose, use a line chart. That's just a scatter plot where you connect the individual dots. You should not connect the individual dots if the individual dots are not following a development. So most of the time you should use a line chart only if there is a continuous background that's time, probably space, that connects the different occurrences. And if this is not the case, you should not connect the individual points, just leave them as individual points. If you have some frequency distribution, amount, counts of data in respect to another measured data you can use histogram or candle density plot and most of the time if you have two variables you will 
probably like to fall back to the scatter plot as the most simple and easiest to understand representation of data. Okay, that was for the theoretical part. And now there will be two additional videos in respect to the uh, technical um, doing of the of the uh, scatter plot and the bar chart. Feel free to also use a pie chart. You just have to change one click um, to uh, achieve a pie chart from your data, and you will see how you can connect your data from your database to LibreOffice Calc. One word here, um, I do not explain that in the technical videos, but if your database does not show up directly in LibreOffice Calc, you have to open the data uh, sources view and then right click in the area where you probably have already see some databases. If you haven't uh, registered your database, it will probably not show up there. You have to right click there and say add another database or manage databases and then you can add your database um, if it's not already showing up there with a dialog. I think this should be possible to do. If not, just drop me a message either via the email or if you are a part of the Slack channel then just ask me over the Slack channel and I might then there explain that for everyone or if you figure that out yourself feel free to present the solution also in the Slack channel. With that I leave you to practical videos and I will see you soon.